Welcome, everyone. Um, as we just sort of explained, this is uh, PBS Kids. We are doing something called the Juice Box Jam. Um, today, we're going to introduce you to making games for kids. Um, so we have been set up in the room downstairs in the retreat, the third floor. And we've had a lot of people come by uh, interested. And um, this, is, this is what we've been getting a lot of. But why? <laughs> um, why have we come out to uh, something like Mag Labs to uh, do a jam? And it was, it was pretty much introduce the challenge and um, the restrictions of making games for kids and trying to get more developers interested into it, introduce it to them. Um, as I have played a lot of uh, indie games, I have realized that a lot of the mechanics in indie games um, have basically, uh, they can be developed into kids games, actually. So uh, the game on the left-hand side is uh, basically a color matching game. It's a party game, uh, but they can adjust it just a little bit and it would be a great kids game. The game on the right is sort of like an engineering game where you try to figure out how to make the, the steam ship work and then you have to keep running that steam ship. But with a little bit of adjusting, this would also be an awesome kids game. And then on the bottom is a typing game where you are uh, basically leveling up and getting new abilities by typing out what the abilities you want to use. And that once again, could be adapted into an awesome kids game. Um, so this is kind of what stemmed this whole sort of project. And we realized that a lot of developers that come out of school uh, don't really think about kids because they don't have kids. And they're not really at the age of thinking about having kids. So um, let's get started with the panelists. OK. Uh, great. So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of knowing and engaging your audience to kick this off. No, you're good. All right, so kids games. Uh, we have a lot of them. Uh, we've developed over 600 games to be exact over the past many, many years. Uh, and you might uh, recognize some, some characters, some shows in this list, and, and you might not. Uh, we've done some kind of digital only games, and then we um, have games that um, are you know companions to all the shows that you see on TV and on our streaming platforms. Um, so I'm going to start off with kind of a core crucial component um, of making a kids game for us, uh, and that's the kids, uh, our audience. It's really the center of our whole uh, PBS Kids learning ecosystem. Um, they are super sassy and fun. They're crazy and brilliant. They're creative. Uh, they can be quite bossy, uh, they're very determined, and they can be very quiet. Uh, but most importantly, they're very, very honest. Um, and so knowing your audience and knowing that is really the most important step in making a great kids game. And really a great game, even if it's not a kids game, is knowing your audience and how they play, what they're interested in playing, and what they play. Uh, and the PBS Kids audience uh, are kids aged 2 to 8. Um, so like Julie was saying, it, it might uh, have been a while since since many of you have been around kids or in the same room as kids. Um, so here's just a quick reminder of kind of the, the broad audience um, that we deal with and get to interact with every day when we make our kids games. Oh, yeah. The fairy toy. The Furby toy. <laughs> a bear with a tiger on his head and a mouse eating cheese. And Jet Bite Saw. These are ninja mad libs. Yes, they're ninja mad libs. And here it goes. Come on, ninjas, guilty and strong. Let's chant our ninja fighting song. Kick your fists. <laughs> Hi, 
subscribe slash your bottom. Any guesses? Lava. What? Lava. Lava. Lava science. How about all the science experiments that we do? Science. Yeah. <laughs> Fire trucks. Fire trucks is science. What else is science? What is science? When when people discover things. Math. Okay. What else? Paper? Paper? Paper. Paper. <laughs> Learning about light, I guess. Light? Or life? Life. Life. Oh, okay. And nature. Well, you can see how plants grow. See what animals need, see what plants need. Do chemical reactions. And lots of stuff like that. What is your favorite thing to play? Zingo. Zingo? That's a good one. I like that. Sand. Sand? The kinetic sand? Okay. Kick the ball. Okay, that's a good game. Minecraft. What do you love about that? You can create and everything looks like pixels and blocks. Peewee, kiwi, cherry, tomato, phone, your fries, Sausage sizzle. <laughs> One last turn for that person, and then it's time to put the cup. <laughs> All right. Um, so you can clearly see the the difference here, just between the ages. Um, how, what they think science is, even what's their favorite game. You have a lot of tactile play, you have active play, you have Minecraft, so they thought of a digital game. Um, so for us, you know, knowing our audience uh, means understanding how, you know, how they play. How do they want to play the shows? How do they want to interact with our characters? Uh, what interactions are the most intuitive and playful? Um, is it dragging something? Is it swiping? Is it actually holding the device and moving it back and forth? Um, is it getting away from the device, and can we use this as a catalyst for them to then play in the real world? Um, what kinds of experiences inspire them? And what do they find curious and interesting? Um, because our kids aren't gonna be learning from our games, and Jen will talk a little bit more about you know, our, our learning goals, um, if they don't actually play it. Um, so they have to be super engaging, um, and that's something that we need to keep up on, because we're, we're no longer kids anymore. Um, so, how do we do this? Um, so at PBS uh, Kids, playtesting is one of the most important things that we do in our game production process. Why? Well, I already spoke a little bit about it. But basically, these kids are tiny, amazing sponges that soak up knowledge, but they soak up knowledge in many different ways um, and at many different paces. So it's not just because of their age, um, but each kid brings their own experiences and background to each game that they play. You can't assume that every child is going to know what a bridge is. They might not have ever seen a bridge or crossed a bridge. Also, you can't assume that kids know how to tap and drag something on the screen. Um, this may be the very first time they're interacting with a game on a device, and we need to make sure we're designing um, the games and the curriculum for that. Um, so we have our own local playtesting program where we bring games and apps at all stages of production, uh, directly to preschools and to elementary schools. And we've really built up a community of teachers that let us come into the classrooms uh, and sit next to the six-year-olds and ask them, hey, what did you play on the playground today? Um, so that's just another way we get, we get to know um, our audience. 
Um, so what do we bring to play testing? Uh, we literally bring everything we can. Uh, and you can kind of see an array of things here. We bring basic prototypes. We bring paper prototypes. Uh, and we make them. Uh, we bring alphas, we bring betas, and we also bring things we've already launched um, so that we can keep learning and keep iterating um, and, and learning how the play patterns are kind of progressing with our audience. Um, but what do we not bring? We don't bring our assumptions, because that could be very dangerous. Um, being completely open to kid criticism is really the name of the game. And it could be really shocking, and it's usually always pretty funny. Um, it's very valid, and we take that to heart. So I'm just going to run through a quick examples um, of playtesting kind of in terms of engagement. Um, you know, that kind of helped us uh, with our just overall game development and how we design games for kids. Uh, so first, uh, Wild Kratz is a show all about learning the awesome creature powers that animals have. And in the show, uh, the Wild Kratz bros wear these awesome creature power suits and they get to mimic uh, what the animals do. So in this app, uh, kids are being asked to tilt their device back and forth to mimic the swing of an orangutan. Uh, and so you can see the one of the bamboo is white, and so once it's white, then you can hit that hand button and Martin can su you know, successfully grab onto it. So we play tested this uh, with six-year-olds, and I'm sitting next to one boy, and he's, he's really, he's struggling. He's really trying to get it, but he has the biggest smile on his face, and he's so engaged. And he's going and he's going and I'm like, why, why are you smiling so much? You know, like, you know, we, you know, you've been playing for a while. He's like, it's just so hard. And it was like, he loved that challenge. Uh, and that's what kept him motivated. It kept him engaged. Um, so kids really like challenge. Um, you just have to be smart about how you introduce that challenge. Uh, and Jen's going to speak more to that too. Uh, so next, the power of characters. Um, so at, at PBS, we have the awesome liberty of working with amazing producers who are creative and thoughtful um, and just build these wonderful worlds and characters. And that's what kids want to, that's who they want to play with. Um, so in these two examples, that's really the, char the power of the characters came through. Um, so the top one is a, a show called Peg Plus Cat, uh, which is a math show. Um, and you can see that kind of yellow triangle uh, above the, the little... Um, chick there. Uh, and so once we've launched this game, we went back into our analytics. Uh, and we could see very clearly through like a heat map analytic uh, that there are so many clicks on that adorable little pig. <laughs> um, and in this game, uh, you can't interact with the pig right now because the game is asking you to find the right amount of water from the pail to fit that little chick. Uh, but the kids, they, they want to play with what they want to do. They want that agency. Uh, and they want to interact with who they want to. Um, so this is a great example of when we launched something and then we said, okay, we need to give them more options to kind of play and learn in the way that they, in the order they want to. Uh, and then down here, uh, we have a game called Mindy's Moonball, uh, which, which we've, uh, it's in development right now. Uh, but when we took it to testing, imagine there is a big play button right here um, that said play or go. And so when we brought it to testing, and as a team, we all review the games, all the grown-ups would set the trajectory of the basketball and hit the play button. But in kid testing, every single kid tapped Mindy. And this is Mindy. Uh, and she's the adorable youngest character in the show who always asks a lot of questions. She's very engaging. And the kids wanted Mindy to throw the ball. They wanted that connection. Um, and that was like a real kind of grown-up fail. Like, here we're following the directions of using, you know, the button that was given to us. But the kids wanted to engage in a much more organic way. Um, so now there is no play button. You just get to tap on Mindy um, and engage there. And then lastly, um, creative problem solving. Uh, I mentioned how kids soak up knowledge differently, uh, so we should allow them to problem solve creatively in a way that they want. So the top left, uh, this is a game from Ruff Ruffman called Fish Force, and we were testing a prediction mechanic where we wanted to see if kids um, understood that concept of, of um, prediction based on their gameplay. And so it, the uh, mechanic was to draw the path. You can see that little, sorry, it's so small on the screen, the little plushie there. You had to draw the path where you think the plushie would go once you kind of hit the push button. And this kid was like, OK. And he drew the biggest target possible, um, saying, well, it can go in any of this area. And we were like, hmm, well, yeah, you're right. Um, so there they took the mechanic a different way, um, which, which was awesome. Uh, the bottom uh, is a 
game we're working on right now from a show called Ready, Jet, Go. And in this, you have to build a really um, a stable structure or some other challenge. And so in this one, uh, you can't get your little astronaut wet because a cloud is going to come by. Um, and so this is about like level three of the game. And in previous levels, we talked about you know building a roof, like triangles as being stable. And so uh, in this level, the idea was that the kids would just build their own roof and be like a triangle. Uh, but this six-year-old girl decided to do it her own way and totally like did an inverse triangle. Um, and I was like, is it going to work? I don't know, because I've never tried it. Uh, and it did. Um, so I think that's just a really good example of how these kids think outside the box. Um, and as a you know kind of game designer, you have to allow yourself um, to be able to kind of think in that way, think how your audience is going to interact. Uh, and then the last video, um, so we did some cool experiments uh, with a PBS Kids wearable that connects to an app <laughs> through Bluetooth, <laughs> sneak peek. Um, and so uh, we really want to get kids away from the screen. Um, uh, and so uh, you'll see I asked this boy a question and he kind of takes it in a really fun way. <laughs> now how do we play the sound? <laughs> so we made a dance game <laughs> uh, because this little boy so clearly uh, that's all he wanted to do. Um, and so we were able to kind of make new experiences based off what we saw um, in testing. Uh, so I'm going to pass it on to Jen. All right, so PBS Kids makes educational games, and I say that with a lot of pride, because our games, many of them, have made an actual impact on children's learning that's measurable. And we've done research, summative evaluations, pre-tests, pre post-tests post in mathematics and literacy have shown growth in a variety of areas and early letter sound awareness, sometimes um, in order to number un understanding. So there are lots of ways that we have used games to educate children. Um, but what you might be familiar with, and if you could switch the next slide, um, this is a nice contrast. You can see that kind of traditionally when people think of digital games that are educational, there's a tendency to think of a digital worksheet. This example of a multiple choice question, you know, pick which shape um, fulfills the requirement of the question. And, um, you know, you can do it that way. You can do shape recognition that way. Or you can play a fun platformer game with Cookie Monster where he's dressed as a pirate and you're in the Caribbean and you're collecting jewels that are shaped um, in different ways and recognizing shapes in a, in a different sort of environment that's far, far more playful. So we really try to make learning playful. And Shannon said this over and over again, engaging, right? So it's not just a matter of what impact it makes. It won't make an impact unless it's also fun. So really critical from our gaming philosophy. You could switch to the next slide, Julie. And so, you know, kind of a foundation of everything we do is our curriculum frameworks. And uh, we don't just want to push facts on kids and have them walk around telling you all the planets in the solar system, right? Shannon mentioned in the example of a particular game where you're building a structure and you're using triangles to support the roof and the structure. You know, we want kids to have these kinds of higher level concepts. And so I have an example here of an infographic that Julie made that explains the engineering design process. So we don't just want to teach facts, we want to teach practices and model them and get kids to do them over and over again and build confidence in them and kind of grow their mindset about their ability to build, to think like engineers. So the focus of this game jam was to build an engineering game, which is why I chose this particular infographic, but we have some for each area of each framework, literacy, math, social, emotional development, and we'll soon be working on an arts framework. So this is a real foundation of all of that we create. If you can go to the next slide, Julie. Um, another really key part of our philosophy is that we want to include all learners. So uh, we have this kind of theory of change, as you can see in this image. And if you start at the panel that says equality, really when people design um, a, an educational environment for children, there's a tendency to kind of provide one solution for everyone, one scaffold for everyone. And this theory of like one solution fits all, it doesn't work. We know this. We've experienced this probably firsthand in the classroom when we've been given assignments and supports and they haven't necessarily helped us. So what can we do to improve upon that? Well, we can think about equity solutions. We can think about giving everybody what they need. So that next panel that says accessible is really about providing equitable supports. So giving each learner what they need to succeed. Now in this example where you see there's this child that's the shortest of all of them has the double scaffolds, there's a tendency to 
focus a lot on the differences between learners, um, and that can create some stigma, and it's also hard to scale one um, solution per learner. And so we really have to think about solutions that are more efficient than that, and also reconsider the learning context. So in that third panel, we have this different environment in the aquarium where the, the, the barrier has been removed, there's no obstruction, and everybody can access and, and see the fish and en enjoy the experience. Um, and we, we did that because we could actually take a step back and recognize the barriers that we had created in the learning environment and remove them. And then finally, kind of the ultimate goal is to focus on universal design for learning, not just uh, reduce barriers, but also provide options that give kids lots of challenges and supports and their caregivers as well. So in that last panel, you see everybody at the aquarium kind of, you know, touching the creatures in the tidal pool, uh, taking photographs of the things they see, documenting, documenting them in different ways. And so this is kind of the ultimate goal of uh, PBS Learning Games is to pri to provide different options for different learners and invite everybody to the table. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, really, in, in the theme of reducing barriers, there are a couple practical things that you can do. Uh, you can design content so that it's not just available on one platform. So when our producers create content, they're able to publish to our pbskids.org website, but also um, pr uh, publish to as, as an app in Android um, and iOS stores. And so we really try to make sure we reach everybody. And, um, and then there's also this factor of, you know, screens aren't everything. We really want, especially young children who learn a lot from firsthand experiences, um, and kind of construct understanding from the real world to go out into the real world and be inspired by the, the experiences they uh, play and watch to just kind of recreate and build skills in the real world. So we'll show some examples of this later. And we can go to the next slide, Julie. Um, and then another practical way to reduce barriers is really, you know, to provide accessibility features and assistive technology f features. And some simple things you can do is to run your, um, your fonts and backgrounds through color contrast checkers, make sure that there's a high enough contrast that uh, folks with low vision can, can see things um, and, uh, and participate equally, and then provide closed captioning. And, uh, and then, if possible, localize, make the experience available in other languages. And we have a, a large um, Hispanic population that utilizes our content and, uh, and we want to make sure that families and uh, parents and children can participate equally. So we try to do that as much as we can and uh, provide alternative text descriptions that uh, are available for screen readers so that individuals who are um, blind or have low vision can enjoy the content on the page too. So just practical things that you can do to reduce barriers. We go to the next um, slide, Julie. And then I would say another thing that's important, I mean, Shannon emphasized this over and over again, play testing. So we took uh, this particular game, it's a sliding game called Slide a Mizzou, and the cat in the hat builds that app. And it's a game where you explore and you investigate um, how changing the height of the slide and adding different textures um, impacts friction and the movement of the, of the characters Nick and Sally down the slide. How can you make them go faster um, than thing one and thing two? How can you make them go slower? And so you're manipulating um, and kind of engaging in the simulation. And so kids were really having to keep into the height of the slide. That's an important factor in the simulation, but some kids weren't really able to see the differences in the slide heights because of the way they were shown on screen in the perspective. So that before image shows the canopies. It shows these stacked units that don't have um, any markings on them. And we realized after testing with a child who had low vision that um, you know she really struggled to be able to see the differences in height. So what could we do to make it better? Well, remove the distractions. We took away the canopies, and then we added number values to the different block units on the slide to make it clear to represent in multiple ways what the slide height was and make it easier for kids to manipulate that. So we can go on the next slide, Julie. And then we want to offer lots of ways for kids to interact. So when we think about young children in particular, you consider their, their motor skills, their fine motor skills are still not generally very well developed and some kids will struggle to just drag something across the screen, the screen or to click hold and drag the mouse. So what can we do to simplify that for them? Well, make things tappable as much as you can. And if you have a desktop experience, make sure that um, you know the objects, the game objects, can click and stick to the mouse cursor and be clicked to drop them. Or in the case of the sliding game, you add, you paint on the texture butter onto the slide or sand or honey, all the fun things you can um, put on that slide, and you can just click and auto-complete. So these are just simple ways to just make it possible for children, especially young children, to participate. And then the next um, slide just talks about different um, engagement strategies. So sometimes kids will love playing a leveled game. Even us as adults, we might like a win state that's really clear and goal-driven. Uh, but there are times even in our own lives and in, in children's lives where they might want to alternate 
between something that's very goal oriented and something that's just free, open, and creative. So in this example, we have a bridge game that guides children towards understanding the principles of building a strong, strong enough and long enough bridge. They're guided through uh, a scaffolded leveled experience. And then they are um, kind of graduated after enough of that guided experience to a more open-ended game. And they can create their own bridges with no constraints. So this is a really nice way to kind of explore, uh, you know, just letting kids be creative. And as that young child said in the video that um, Shannon showed, to discover, which is really what science is a lot about. Um, and so we'll move on to the next slide, um, and I'm almost done. Uh, there's really a lot of stock put into supporting kids' development of executive function skills. If you haven't heard about this, we have a really great app. Um, it's called Cookie Monsters Cookie Challenge, and it's a lot about kind of developing self-control, focus, being able to organize yourself and your thoughts. So one thing that helps young kids a lot is getting clarity about how close they are to completing a task. So in the case of this particular game, you've got the dragon and he's got to make his way to the castle and there's this visual representation of his progress to the castle and there's also voiceover that reinforces, hey, the dragon is much closer now, look how many bridges you've built. So this sense that, you know, we're really providing feedback to kids on their mastery and that's really important to them. It's important to us also. And then I'll just conclude by saying one of the most important things is to really give a lot of thought to the feedback that you provide children. When you are guiding them in the game experience, you don't want to just drop them with a good job or a try again. That's just not giving them the guidance they need to succeed. So there are a bunch of examples on this screen that again kind of relate back to that bridge building game that, that go a little bit further than that, that are contextual, that are graduated. So they provide feedback that might be less specific at the beginning um, and more encouragement oriented. And then as, they, as the kid tries over and over again and may have repeat fails, there's more specific uh, strategic advice given. And sometimes it's enough to just get kids to reflect on what they did. Oh wow, what happened? Because sometimes they're just moving through it so quickly that they're not necessarily stopping to think about um, all of the cause and effect relationships in front of them. So that's enough said for me. I'm going to pass right, So uh, my name's Chip Bell. I already introduced myself. Uh, I wanted to talk about performance in games. Um, one thing that you should keep in mind when writing a game for a kid is it needs to be fast. Go ahead and next slide. Because go ahead. Oh, yeah. now, regardless of device, uh, one thing that's happened in recent years is that kids love tablet devices. They're, they're great for kids because it's a more intuitive way for kids to interact. Um, if you look at, I remember in kindergarten, finger painting, you know, very early on we're sort of taught to, to reach out and touch. And that's how kids want to experience the world. That's how kids want to experience their game. So when I talk about performance, I'm really focused on devices. And part of this is because devices are just less powerful, like your phone or an iPad or something like that. Go to the next slide. So here's a worst case for us. Uh, the iPad mini uh, Gen 1. It has a half a gig of RAM, it has iOS 8, and it has 16 gigs of uh, hard drive space. Uh, and it's not a lot. Many uh, games that come out today would not run in that, uh, on that device. Um, and these are things you have to keep in mind. This is something that we Whenever we build a game, we have to keep this particular device in mind, along with, uh, you know, obviously Android as well. There's lots of little lower end Android devices that are very similar in specs. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind when bu building uh, games for kids is that they always they don't always have the latest and greatest device. A lot of times they have just the device, the, the old tablet that mom or dad had, and so it gets passed along. Um, a lot of them have an old OS version. Uh, in fact, for our, for our um, Android test bed, I think we test as low as Android 4.2, maybe, or is it 4.4 now? Uh, so we're, oh, so we're up to 4.4, everyone, uh, which is still very, very old. Um, they also may not have very much hard disk space because they may have a whole bunch of other games on there, or they may have downloaded videos. Kids like videos, so you've got to. Oh, that was a storm warning. Y'all heard that? Y'all heard that? That was kind of scary. Everybody, uh, everybody inside? Okay, good. Uh, so some some devices don't have a lot of hard disk space. They've got a lot of videos. Uh, we'll wait for the storm to pass. <laughs> I don't have a signal, so mine will surprise you. Okay, that would be good. Right into the the key part. No. All right. So some devices don't have a lot of hard disk hard disk space because of. Um, uh, videos, things like that. Some may be offline for extended periods. So when you build your game, you have to have offline uh, as sort of this first class citizen in your mind of how the game will be played. So if your game is dependent on downloaded content, you need to think about how you're going to handle the case when they can't get that downloaded content. It's, um, 
if it's crucial for your gameplay, maybe you should redesign how the game is pulling in that content. All right, let's go to the next one. So again, you have to code for these use cases. You have to think about all of these things and think about what's going to make the best experience. Let's go to the next one. Uh, so I'm going to do a case study here. This is a game that I worked on when I first started at, um, at PBS. It's a game called Measure Up. Let's go to the next slide. Um, it's an app targeted at the, uh, I think I, when I mistyped the slide, it's actually three to five. Is that, is that correct, uh, Jen? It's like the three to five range. And, we're, and it's geared towards teaching kids about measurement skills, things about length, um, capacity, and weight. All right, I always, always forget them for some reason. Uh, it's a set of HTML5 games and uh, videos that support this, um, all of this, this curriculum. Um, it's, they're sort of woven into three separate, um, three separate sort, of, separate sort of tracks, right? Sort of tracks around uh, measuring capacity, measuring weight, measuring length. And so these are three separate tracks, uh, but they're it's sort of woven all together. Oh, they're on the fourth floor, everyone. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's bundled into a native app using a technology called Cordova. We use this a lot. Uh, we're a big web shop, so we like to write our games using web technologies, but we use Cordova to bundle these together. Uh, and there sometimes are performance caveats. Let's go to the next slide. So we got close to release time. Uh, we began to test on our test bed. We have many devices in our test bed. We began to sort of go through the list and sort of focus on ones that we feel like are going to get a lot of downloads. Uh, what we found is that the game wasn't actually very playable on low-end devices. It was, I mean, on some devices we were getting frame rates as low as 10 frames per second, which I mean is completely unacceptable. Uh, so. We're now at the point where this large group of our audience is not going to be, be able to play this game. So let's go to the next slide. So, so what do you do in this sort of case? You, you've built this game, you're really proud of it, and you begin to do some of that final testing, and then you're finding that there's parts of your game or there's your entire experience is completely broken because of performance concerns. So what you do is you begin to debug. You begin to use the tools that are out there for you. So if you're a game developer, there's all kinds of tools out there like a profiler and looking at how memory usage is, how memory is allocated and really sort of digging into the nuts and bolts of your game to try to understand what's going on. Um, and looking at you know what sort of things take a long time and tools like this are very powerful. For us, we're on the web, so this is actually the Chrome Dev Tools. We use this a lot on a daily basis. Um, go to the next slide. And so what did, what did we do? What, how do we end up resolving the issue? Well, uh, profiling revealed uh, a couple of things. A, there was a memory leak in how a texture was allocated. Fixing that memory leak solved a lot of problems. We also found that there were some Easter egg animations that were A, very hard to find. So in other words, a kid would probably never find this animation without stumbling upon it. And by removing that animation, we actually saw a lot of performance gains. Now, and these, these animations, made the experience better, but they were at the detriment of some users because it lowered the performance for those devices, those lower end devices. And so you've got this trade-off of, of what to do when, you, when you've got a game that runs, it's an awesome experience in one place and, not, and it's completely unplayable in another. And so we get to the next point, which is progressive enhancement. Uh, this is a big sort of term in web technology, uh, in the web land, people like to use this when talking about JavaScript and HTML, CSS, but it also really applies for your game. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And so what uh, progressive enhancement is, is it's this idea of building the lowest end. It sounds like there was a, okay, uh, um, uh, um, uh, what were we talking about? No, I'm kidding. Uh, so progressive enhancement, the idea is that you, you build a game that runs on your lowest spec possible. You, you make sure that experience works. Your core experience is there for your lowest end devices. And then what you do is as you, as you work your way up, you work your way up through devices and make sure that you have your core experience, but you can build on top of that for, for your most powerful device. And so instead of thinking best experience possible on the nicest device and then go, well, let me fix problems as I go down. Start at the bottom and work your way up. Think about what that, that worst case is going to be like and make sure you've got a really solid, solid experience there. And again, some of the best games have the simplest mechanics and have the simplest UI. And so thinking about that approach, you're going to really be guaranteed to have a great reach because your, your app is now available in as many places as possible. Let's go to the next slide. So, that's, the, that's one of our big lessons learned. Let's go to the next slide there. It's testing on as many devices as possible. Try to find these performance problems as soon as possible because the cost up front is a lot smaller than the cost 
much later when you've already built this game, you've already got these gigantic assets in there, or you've done your animations a certain way, you're sort of committed. You're a lot more committed at that point, and it's a lot harder to find the problems. Uh, and again, especially with testing, don't put it off for the lower end devices. Sometimes it's very tempting to do so because you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to see how it's going to run on this thing. I, I just want to play my game because I'm really proud of this thing. Don't put it off. It's very important. It's crucial, especially for reaching people. If, your game, if you're trying to reach people with your game, it's got to run on those iPad minis and those little tiny Samsung Galaxy tabs. Um, and as sort of a final note, add your features progressively. Start with the, the, the lowest level device. Make sure you have a good core experience and then work your way up into to a richer or fuller experience for those iPad Pros and those, those gigantic desktops. Go to the next slide. I think that's me, yeah. All right, thank you. It's gonna work. Reach. I'm gonna lean in. Oh, no, don't hurt yourself. Uh, do I need the other one? You wanna trade seats? Yeah, that'll work. Let's just trade seats. Oh, uh, and just to add a little bit to the QA stuff that Chip was talking about, um, the products team I work on, we have a number of team members and we are on the front lines of a lot of testing after the measure up experience. Uh, I went out and bought uh, our team some really bad, uh, awful devices and forced them to use it. Uh, so if you're uh, going to be testing your own stuff and you don't want to spend a fortune, it's a good idea to just get those worst case scenarios. So uh, that iPad mini first gen and the uh, Samsung Galaxy Tab 3, those seem to be the most popular older devices, uh, low, low in spec devices that kids use. And so if they work, if, if stuff works on those, it's gonna work pretty much anywhere. Um, you can go ahead and move forward. So um, so our team works on the kind of the uh, distribution end of our you know content pipeline in that we make the places that we aggregate our content and. Uh, and then we try to make sure that as many kids as possible have uh, things like our PBS Kids Games app or go to the pbskids.org website so that they can play those, th uh, those awesome games. Um, and so we're lucky we have a big brand uh, that you know, we uh, can you know, really use to push our content out. Um, but it's, uh, it's not so easy, like, to, as you think, to actually get people to play games. We have uh, had quite a few cases of apps that we've launched that didn't get as much traction as we'd like. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about the sort of thinking that you need to put into making sure that, you know, while you're working on your awesome game that you're setting yourself up for success so that kids will actually play it. So let's keep going. So one really important thing to think about as you're trying to figure out like what, you know, who you're going to market to and what that needs to look like uh, when you're working on a kid's game. Um, and, and you should, you know, definitely be thinking of this and starting to work on your marketing even before your game is ready. You know, it's like the kind of the indie game approach now of like as soon as you got something that looks cool like start getting stuff out there getting some feedback trying to get some sort of an audience involved um, but this is a very different audience so you know if you're making a game for like tiny little kids about shapes um, you know their parents are going to be the people that are going to pick out the apps and games that they're going to use so you don't need to think about like uh, well I need to make a like a gameplay trailer that uh, you know my two-year-old nephew is going to love like because he's not going to watch it uh, it's going to be mom that's going to you know pick out whatever goes on the iPad. Um, and so this is all from our market research we've done over the years. And this is a, you know, a lot about how we think about our different age ranges and how we're gonna market stuff. Um, so the kids five to six, the parent and the child, uh, are really kind of involved in the decision making. So a lot of times the, you know, the kid will like, you know, hear something from an older sibling or cousin or on the playground about like, oh my gosh, Roblox is so cool. Like, mom, I gotta have Roblox. Uh, or they may, you know, end up in the app store because they accidentally clicked an ad and they see something cool and it's like, I love dressing up puppies and I have to add this mom. Uh, but still mom is, and dad are going to be the, they're going to be the gatekeepers um, and the kids don't have money uh, and they don't have the passwords probably yet. So, you know, it's still going to be like the parent making a decision, but the child is increasingly kind of driving to the parent, you know, what they want. Uh, and then kids seven plus, it's mostly kids that are driving the decision making there. And uh, even if the parents are still a gatekeeper, like the kids are going to pick what they want and they're not going to play whatever it is by and large that mom and dad, you know, pick out for them. They're just going to take stuff to mom or dad and uh, say, this is what I want. I want Minecraft. I want Roblox. I want Barbie. Um, and, you know, increasingly after that age, kids have more and more agency. Like, you know, uh, there's a lot of different settings within the different app, uh, the, the, mobile ecosystems now where you know a kid can just like tap something in the app store that they like and mom gets a message and can just say yes or no 
uh, and they can download it right away. So, um, you know, really got to think about if you're making something for kind of kids age seven plus, um, you, you want to make it appeal to them because they are going to be the ones looking at the, you know, the store listings or the YouTube videos or whatever. All right, move on. Uh, but besides parents and kids, uh, some other people to, to consider um, would be teachers, grandparents, and caregivers. And I'd put a lot of emphasis on the teachers because if you're making uh, some sort of educational media, you know, educational game for kids, uh, the, there's actually a ton of use in schools and teachers are always looking for, uh, you know, good uh, quality uh, stuff that aligns with their, uh, you know, their learning goals within their classroom uh, that is also like fun and engaging for the kids, you know, like they... We find that um, our traffic on pbskids.org uh, pretty much doubles during the school year. So in the summer, it's like we get a slump. The website gets like four or five million visitors a month. And then that doubles up to like nine, ten million visitors during the school year because, you know, it's one of the like things that they're allowed to play in the library or on their iPads, uh, you know, when they have like free choice time or whatever way it is that they're being allowed to play games. So. Uh, don't don't leave out the teachers in your thought process of if you're making an educational game like who who might I try to get to you know who who which adult in the kid's life would I try to use to like you know make sure that a kid's playing it next slide all right so what are they looking for um, you know very different things really uh, you know parents like free stuff uh, actually all adults like free stuff um, but especially if you got a you know two year old and a four year old like you know plopping down like. 10 bucks a month on a subscription or, you know, every time your kid comes running to you with an app request and it's $3, uh, that, that's tough. Like, you know, the parents don't tend to buy just tons of uh, game content, um, they, but they want educational and trustworthy. And if you make the right sort of thing and you, you know, you position it well, parents will, they will pay money for it, um, but you have to be very thoughtful about it. Um, kids love characters. Um, and I know that can sound like a huge challenge whenever, you know, we're sitting up here from a television company and someone's paying a lot of money and taking a lot of time to make these awesome worlds with like rich animations and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but there are lots of other like approaches to creating like characters that kids will love in a game setting. And, and I always think of things like the Tokoboka apps uh, where a lot of them have very simple, only like two frame like states that change for like, you know, their, uh, what's it, Toka City? life or whatever it is you know they have you know like you can drag a character onto the couch and they'll just kind of sit on the couch you can drag them to the stove and they'll put on a chef's hat or whatever but they give those characters like so much personality through the illustrations uh and the kind of the things you can do with them that it's like it's not expensive uh to create you know in the grand scheme of things when it comes to art it's not a lot of animation but it has a ton of like uh things for the the kids to identify and all the varied like characters they have uh, and then for teachers, you know, the, the most important things really are educational and safe. There's a lot of other words up there, but, you know, teachers are bound by the law to uh, make sure that any sort of digital stuff they have is meeting the privacy regulations that they're required to follow. So, uh, you know, if you ha make a kid's uh, game and you put a whole bunch of ads that do, you know, crazy tracking and stuff in it, like educators aren't going to be able to use it. Um, so just keep that in mind. Next one. Um, also think about like, you know, where, you know, depending on who you're going to target to try and get, uh, you know, your stuff used, uh, think about where it is that they're going to get their information. So it's really different places. So like if you're going after an older kid audience, like definitely trying to figure out a way to like reach them through YouTube videos of like gameplay or, you know, some, or some sort of things for like the, you know, the kids that are really into making things that kind of goes maybe behind the scenes and how like your art's made or something like that, any sort of kind of hook you could get through YouTube because that's where they're all that uh, is cool. Or if it's for younger kids, you know, it's going to have to be the parents and they get that sort of information about like, you know, what type of apps are like good for kids or like what type of apps your kids are going to like. They're going to get that from their social circles and from like searching app stores and also from teachers. Um, actually, my second grade daughter came home this week with basically an ad for uh, like a, a book app, like from the teacher that the company had given to her teacher. And then she just like stuck the flyer in the, uh, you know, in the thing to come home with the homework. And it was like, hey, this is an awesome reading app. You should get it. And that's a pretty big endorsement coming from a teacher. So even, you know, if you're just, uh, you know, able to kind of like <clears throat> pound the pavement and like, you know, go talk to some teachers and, you know, try to get them to like your stuff. Uh, you know, it's a good avenue to try and get some kids to, to play your stuff and to reach the parents. 
and probably like the most trustworthy source for parents for information too, I would say. Um, next slide. All right, so thinking about uh, who you're gonna try to get to be your audience, uh, you need to think about like what devices you're targeting. Uh, so if you're wanting to make a kind of a consumer facing app and it's uh, either maybe it won't be educational or it will be educational, but you don't really see it used by schools or whatever, um, you know, at home kids are using tablets. That's the uh, you know, predominant uh, thing and it's increasingly the really cheap tablets. It's like every holiday season we get an influx of, you know, on December 25th, we start getting an influx of uh, new users from new devices that are actually like increasingly like worse in spec uh, and perform worse every single year. I swear next year we're going to have $20 tablets, you know, at the like impulse buy thing by the gum at Walmart is what everyone's going to get their kids and it's going to give Chip uh, some uh, Rough days uh, ahead. Yeah, some ulcers and... <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, where they are using phones and stuff, it's largely in that age group that we work on. It's largely like Passback or an old device, but it's a, not a very big percentage. Well, we, uh, you know, our large, uh, our, our really huge apps, you know, that we really want to make sure that, like, all the kids can get to, we put those on phones. But we even have some apps that we just do on tablets uh, if it's kind of a more bespoke experience. Um, and then in school. You're going to try and target the school audience. Um, you know, pre-K to second grade, it's iPads. Like the Android really hasn't make much, made much inroads into uh, the education space as of yet. I um, think that could really change because uh, Google has announced that uh, they have a, one manufacturer making a Chromebook uh, tablet that they're piloting in schools this year. And since Chromebooks are like basically the device that every school's been buying for the last couple of years in second grade and up, like they might make a switch, but they haven't yet. Uh, if you're making it for older kids, Chromebook and desktop is where it's at, and it's definitely web technologies. They, they don't install, uh, educators and schools don't really install much on those devices. They just uh, use the web. Um, so you're going to want to think about how to, you know, accommodate that. And another interesting option that uh, Probably won't make anyone any money, but sure is uh, a fun thing to try and design for would be interactive whiteboards. They're basically a giant tablet that 10 people play at once. Uh, so we've done some thinking about that in the past, uh, and teachers definitely, you know, they have those devices and they've told us they love, you know, uh, the games that work well on them. So, next slide. So, pretty much if you're going for a kid's game at home, it's going to, app stores are going to be where you're going to try to you know, distribute your, your stuff. And then for the school, uh, it's like it would be web first. That would be where you can get the biggest audience. Uh, maybe not the highest like immediate revenue opportunity, but um, you know, definitely the biggest audience play. Uh, and then the iOS store for iPad is, those are pretty much the only two options for reaching uh, people in schools with content. Next. Uh, and then so as far as like authoring goes, um, you know, for app stores, Unity, that's, you know, like the biggest game in town. It's, uh, it's great. It's easy to use, cross compiles. Um, we use HTML5 plus Cordova because we want our stuff to work on the web and uh, on, the, on the app stores. Um, increasingly, we know Unity is becoming a better option for that. But, it, you know, we started making these games like five, six years ago. And, uh, you know, Unity didn't even in, in introduce... Uh, like their kind of beta version of the HTML5 web uh, export uh, yeah. until a couple of years ago and until very, very recently, it really just didn't work very well for what we needed it to do. Um, took a long time to load and had really huge download times, but it's getting better. So we think it's an option we're definitely experimenting with. Um, and then if you're going to, you know, do stuff for the web, um, Definitely still the best option is to, you know, pick a, an HTML5 framework, like something like Phaser or, or whatever, uh, and, you know, make your game using that. Um, but like I said, Unity Web GL export is uh, another good option. And then there's lots of other tools out there. If you already happen to be using GameMaker or something like that, you know, they, they do pretty good exports to uh, web. So that's, that's an option as well. And if you want to go for everything, you know, there's, uh, there's, like lots of great options these days. It's I think it's a fun time to be making uh, cross-platform games, whereas like six years ago it was uh, kind of a nightmare. Uh, it's not better. Yeah. All right. I do I have do I have more? Oh yeah, revenue. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone here released their own game? No one's released their own game. I I, I Bish. Oh. Me and me and Chris Bishop, our creative director, made our own little side project a few years back. 
and we made a grand total of about 129 bucks. Uh, and then we put it out for free a month later, and now we're up to like 400,000 downloads. I wish we'd have slapped some ads on that thing, man, but whatever. Um, <laughs> But yeah, making money is hard. Like even for a company as big as PBS with a brand like PBS Kids, uh, making money in the app space in general is pretty getting pretty hard. But in the kids space, it's especially hard because you just have a lot less options with what you can do. Um, you know, there there are some companies that will. Uh, we're all familiar with the game mechanics where, like, you know, and like uh, basically every in-app purchase game now, it's like you, you're you're just walled off at some point. Like you got to buy more gems or you got to get a new card pack or, you know, something like that, you know, that to either keep going that day or to win the game or whatever it is, you got to plop down some money. Um, like that, you know, me personally, I think that's kind of unethical when it comes to kids and our company definitely is not uh, into doing that. So we've done some in-app purchase for content, but not a lot. Uh, and parents really don't like that uh, because, uh, you know, they're used to seeing like the games that are, you know, do it in a really kind of bad way uh, that, you know, are using tricks related to the game mechanics to just make people want to, uh, you know, I don't know, get another car for their dog or whatever it is you do in a kid's game to trick them out of their money. Uh, subscription services are really, uh, really tough. I mean, they make a lot of money, but you've got to be like an ABC mouse or something like that, you know, to get a lot of traction. Um, and uh, then like the direct sale thing, you know, we charge from 99 cents to 2.99 for our apps. And uh, you know, we have some really hard working folks in our marketing department uh, that work with us on things like app store optimization for search because that's the number one way people are finding stuff. And they, you know, also work really hard at putting together uh, some ad campaigns where we're, you know, trying to make uh, at least make our money back on the ads with how many, you know, things we sell. So we're trying to keep the cost of acquisition, you know, down as low as we can. Uh, and it's mostly search ads, the display ads uh, don't do as well for us. So we're trying to find like keyword searches that parents or kids are looking for that match our game well enough that, you know, they're going to, uh, they're going to pay for it and we're going to pay less for the ad than we make when they buy it. Um, so I think one really interesting option for kids stuff that, uh, we're not really able to do because of the way our licensing works, but I would, I think, uh, you know, if I was making independently making kids games, that I would definitely try out is, uh, licensing for, things that are web-based technologies that can either be plugged into an aggregate site uh, and there's some like crazy popular like sites that you would maybe never heard of uh, like coolmathgames.com uh, it's like got thousands of games on it it gets like millions and millions of users across the US every month and they uh, you know it's like just these simple little like math games that aren't even really math games so a lot of them uh, but uh, in other types of educational games and teachers love it and they have their kids play it and they will actually pay you money for your game to license it if they like it. Um, and there's a lot of other options out there. People that will, you know, just pay for a non-exclusive license a few hundred bucks a year. Uh, and then if you're, you know, can get something popular enough, there's things like Amazon because, uh, you know, those HTML5 games can be bundled as native pretty easily. Uh, or you can cross compile if you're using Unity. Um, you know, people like Amazon, they have free time unlimited and they license a lot of kids' content as well. So, uh, you know, and the pay scales are based off different things. On some platforms, it's just like we, you get 400 bucks a year. And uh, that's not a real price. I'm just making something up. But you know, it's like you get paid a few hundred bucks a year and they get a non exclusive license to your game. You can put it as many places as will pay for it. Uh, and then other places, it's like, They'll pay you a small base price, but then depending on how engaging your game is, you'll get paid more. Uh, so if tons of people play your game uh, and they really like it, um, then they'll pay you more money to keep it. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting option to, to, to try, uh, but it does require a lot of like trying to make connections. You know, you can't just cold call or cold email like some folks when your game's done and hope that they'll write you back because there's probably, you know, they probably get 100 games a day out of shovelware companies or whatever. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, that's a kind of bleak outlook, but it is really hard to make money. So do it for the love and do it for the kids, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked about that. All right. I think we're done. Are any questions? Come on, room full of people. What's up?
Yeah, uh, the restrictions uh, outside of the law are per platform, right? So they all have their like best practices, um, but they, by and large, the app stores will just let you, like, they'll just let you do whatever you want as long as you're using the proper platforms because they want you to make them money. Uh, but within the kids categories, you know, it can be a little bit more uh, restrictive on what they find tasteful that they'll let through review. And then you have to uh, remember, uh, COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, doesn't allow any sort of ad networks that use like cross device tracking or anything like that. So you have to be really careful with like how you set up the ads and who you select as your, your ad network to make sure that, you know, uh, they're not tracking from one app to another because that's totally illegal and can get you like, you know, nailed big time. Um, does that answer your question? Kind of. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think beyond like really beyond like what the law is like you can kind of do what you want, you know, as long as it's tasteful. I, you know, we see all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't do ads, so, you know, I can't speak to like what's the best necessarily the best uh, strategy, you know, but I do know you make a lot more money whenever people click the ads and that's why they're so intrusive, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you know, the more taps you get, the more money you get paid uh, from the ad network, but no, it's not. No, uh, no, we, uh, we generally like, well, it's so, it's like a weird formula. So when we pay for ads, uh, for our apps, like the better that our ads perform, the less we pay. Um, and so it's all about like, you know, from the advertiser side, like you, uh, you want a high tap through rate and that's part of why those, uh, and, and so like every, you know, like the advertisers get cheaper advertising and the people like serving up the ads make more money that way. Um, if that makes sense. I actually have a question off of that that I'd like to ask the other one here. So if you're using, let's say I'm writing a native iOS app or a native uh, Android app for the Google Play Store, if I were to use their ad libraries and my app is in the kids category, are the apps that they serve going to be different? Do you know that? Do you know if that's the case? I think you set that up when you set up the ad. Ah, yeah. okay. So you can restrict there you what go. type of uh, content appears in your, uh, in your ads when you set them up. Okay, makes sense. So it's like through your dashboard. It's you know just similar to uh, well, it's similar to any ad network. You can restrict what type of ad show up in your uh, in your ad placement. So you can say like no adult content or no you know you can also like have certain rules about it's like well we made this game for a potato chip company so we don't want other potato chips advertising. You know there's just a lot of filters and stuff uh, through the ad network. So we don't we don't sell cosmetics. Um, really, the only in-app purchases we've done is content, right? Like it's just straight up. Like if you like this thing that was either free or you already paid ninety nine cents for, you can pay another ninety nine cents for like double the content. Uh, but we do we use that as an engagement strategy for everything we do. Um, so within the product space, like our PBS Kids Games app, we're constantly updating it to be uh, either like 
it'll, it'll visually and through like small animations and stuff, it will represent either like seasonality. So Valentine's Day, Halloween, you know, like we just kind of reskin like the basics of the app and put some little things in there or through the games, uh, you know, Shannon and Jen's team, they're thinking about like content updates to like our most popular properties that when they launch paid apps, uh, they're thinking about those updates while they're like making the game. And so they already have like content updates that might be seasonal or whatever um, that do include a lot of just like visual assets that could be, you know, new outfits for the kids to play or new levels that look like the time of year or whatever. Um, you know, it, it's it's something similar, but we haven't ever done anything like that from like a revenue strategy side. Um, but as far as like the apps versus games, so when we're saying 600 games, that's on the website uh, and includes like our whole back catalog. We have about 120 some odd games in the games app that are the HTML5 games. And then we have something around like 30 native apps for the individual shows, right? Yeah. So we don't have, uh, and that's another good point. We. Uh, we found like a, as a strategy over time, like uh, if, if you just have tons and tons of apps, actually the best ones might get lost in the mix. Uh, so while shovelware companies will put out 500 apps, you know, just trying to keyword stuff their entire storefront it, for us, because it's all about uh, like, uh, you know, which shows are the most popular and which apps are the most engaging and that, you know, are the most timely with whatever it is that parents want. Uh, you know, we, we kind of keep our storefront fresh and try not to just throw a whole bunch of apps in there. Uh, obviously that's gone <laughs> um, and so for the past few years we've been building up our inventory um, because we knew that there would be an end to flash and so we look at okay what are the game mechanics what are the shows like Scott said that are the most engaging and they kind of align with with our you know TV with what with, with they're promoting uh, and we'll kind of port games that were flash because oh these mechanics will work really well on on mobile um, and then we'll look for those like seasonal updates because if we know kids are going to that game we will focus on that and then kind of sunset some of the older stuff so we are constantly like evaluating that as we go We <laughs> we just the flagship apps for the most part. It's like the PBS Kids Video app and the PBS Kids Games app. I don't know if we do. We have any TV spots for the producer apps? Uh, not for the producer apps. Uh, when we say producer apps, that's like the cat in the hat app that's like just focused on that property. But we do have, we call them kind of digital throws. Uh, that'll point to like the individual producer games. Uh, but then the tagline is always get them at the free PBS Kids Games app because that's like our main distribution hub. Yeah, and we're restricted uh, because we're uh, public television. We're restricted with uh, regards to trying to sell stuff on air. Um, so like we can't say go buy the cat in the hat app on our air. <laughs> and we're not supposed to compete with like commercial television. And we love kids and we don't want to tell them to buy stuff too. <laughs> and that cat app is free. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we actually we do tell the parents like everywhere we we have like a touch point with parents, that's where we're pushing our apps, you know, through social media, like that's not geared at the kids. It's all about, you know, the parents of the kids and through the PBS parents website and all the, all that stuff. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'd say my, like the stuff that would, would be my go-to is more like free play or like play play, not like game, if that makes sense. Like, Game implies an end goal, I guess, sometimes, right? So Game just, boxes, yeah, 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 just being able to color or like, you know, I love the Daniel Tiger stuff that it's just like Daniel Tiger and his friends and you can have a tea party and it's like, you know, you get tired of the tea party, you quit, you know, it's just like playing a tea party with your doll. So that's, I think that's my favorite for like the little, little ones. 
Daniel Tiger Spin and Sing, great app. Um, it's just kind of randomizes with a spinner and you play a mini game. And sometimes those mini games are really simple. You know, um, you're just, you know, tapping stuff on screen, popping bubbles. It's it's that kind of thing. And I think that, I think Scott's right. It's that more kind of toy-like experience. And that's part of what makes Toka Life and all the Toka apps so popular is that they're not very goal-driven. They're very much like toys or playing house. So, yeah. There's a similar game that recently came out, one of our Ruff, uh, Ruffman Show games, that's about making cookies. And uh, it's very interesting because the mechanic is based around not making the perfect cookies, it's about exploring different ways to make cookies. It's not going to leave time, I think. I can just. It's about um, making cookies and exploring how cookies are made and what, how different combinations of ingredients cause the cookies to be different. Uh, and so, you know, the, the voiceovers and uh, Ruff, the character in, in the game, sort of prompts you and says, hey, how many eggs should we add? How much flour should we add? How long should we bake it? Things like that. And when it gets done, he describes the cookies. Oh, these cookies are a little bit underdone. Or, oh, these cookies are very crispy. Or, these cookies are very chocolatey. And it's not like you got it wrong or right. Instead, it says, it, what will happen is uh, Ruff will then sort of prompt you and say, well, how could, we make, how could we make chewy cookies? And so it's more of a prompt to keep playing and explore. And so what's really interesting is from a learning standpoint, this is really great because it's instead of learning how to make cookies, you've learned sort of how cookies work. And you have a much deeper understanding of what, how a cookie works. And it's real, that's really engaging for kids. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I have like trouble with like color theory and like color design. Sometimes I like so like um like whatever I don't like get into the game sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know, but like alright, we're gonna make a card game and we have like this whatever the why. Uh, but then if it's just a whole simulator because all those things are different. Mm -hmm. uh, what for an adult and overseeing it looks like overseeing like things were just like cloud just like bad for children like how do they react to that? Like how how do you try to keep it simpler or how do they react to bad color design? Much like adults do. They they just close up, move on. You know, and they're brutal about it. I mean <laughs> a story I I might as well grab the mic. A story I hate telling Oh, okay, cool. Um, only because it was like my first week on the job, I built a video web player and we're taking it to kid testing. And first child out of the box takes one look at it and goes, wow, this sucks. <laughs> Here's something I just crushed on for two weeks to try to impress my new boss. And I'm on the fly now recoding and rebuilding it, trying to get it for the next user. And it was like, okay. This is the sort of feedback I'm get, gonna get from now on because they're brutally honest. They don't know how to be political or polite about it. It's their opinion, and their opinion is king, um, which is great. It's <laughs> I've actually learned to love it and respect it in that regard. But it's definitely something to get used to. If you're having trouble with color theory in general, go to uh, Adobe's Color. It's K L K U L R. I think it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and use that as a great starting point. Um, Pantone also uh, does a pretty good job of if you have like one color that, you know, this color needs to be in there somewhere, find me something that works well with it. It's usually a great place to start. Uh, as far as color theory for people that don't like color theory or don't understand it, it's a great like kind of plug and play way of handling it. Uh, hope that answers. <laughs> No worries, man. And also say that for uh, what happens with kids is they, they just lose focus of what you want them to focus on. So if there's too many like fun things going on or too many bright colors, then you'll just see their eyes go all over the place. And then, like Ocean said, then they'll, they'll check out because they don't know how to play. So I think of color when we're play testing uh, as more of what have the, the biggest thing you want is what you want them to focus on. That'll help them progress through the game. Yeah. It's kind of like if you put a face on something and you can't interact with it, you're going to try and then you're going to get over it. It brings me to sort of a side. I remember working on a lot of stuff with uh, Juliet, and, and we got all the colors, and 
you know, you're talking about the color red and the fact that a lot of times red is perceived as very negative for kids. Mm -hmm. like, uh, dark red because a lot of times they'll see red and they think, Stop. Oh man, this is one mm -hmm. bad. And a lot of times like, that's that prompt thing to stop and go take it to whoever's in charge and say, I don't know what to do. Um, and she's totally like, oh, this is red, this is bad. And so sometimes what sometimes we do is we put a five inch or something like orange, orange is like, color red. To jump off of Shannon's point a little bit as well, uh, don't clutter your mechanics. Don't try to gamify everything. Uh, we get a lot of reviews, game reviews, where the developers try to like gamify the intro and they gamify the menu and they gamify it, and you're just like, it's they then they don't know what what's the game. Um, so just like Ocean said, keep it simple when it comes to those things. In, in that regard, think of color as a gentle guide. Uh, Always try to make it the light, like as far as the UX, make those items lighter, you know, thing on your page so that your eye gets drawn to them, but don't make them too abundantly, you know, overbearing. Um, actually, a great case in point for this is like old school animation, like Hanna Barbera. You'd always have these beautiful painted backdrops, and you could tell which items were the items that were going to about to move or they were about to interact with because they were painted lighter. Think of it in sort of that regard as far as when you're handling color. <laughs> I think the child could have written a dissertation on why it was so bad. Um, I thought he called it a stink <laughs> I think that was another design. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, so we so we have our uh, we have like a local play testing program. Um, actually, and Nita here, Nita, raise your hand. Uh, she manages on the PBS Kids team, um, and so we work with preschools, preschools and elementary schools, and Head Starts. Uh, and so we bring content from like prototype to paper prototypes, all the way to like final products um, into schools on a weekly basis, pretty much. So. Crucial. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a wrap, guys. All right. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you.